My name is Adele Barbato. Thank you for being here with me today as I speak to you about my experience applying practical anti-racist change management techniques to the experience of a major digital transformation project at the Fine Arts Museums, which I'll refer to as FAMSF. I've been the collections information manager for FAMSF since October 2019, when I was hired to oversee and manage a major CMS conversion project. A little less than a year later, in July of 2020, I joined the framing committee for the museum's staff-run Inclusivity, Diversity, Accessibility, and Equity Committee, or what we call the IDEA Committee. It's in this joint capacity that I am honored to speak with you all today. I'd like to start this talk by being very upfront about the fact that I am not an expert on racism or anti-racism. Uh, I don't even consider myself a virtue of paragon when it comes to anti-racism because I still have so much to learn and so many questions about the process. What I am is someone who, from a very young age, has witnessed and felt strongly about the toxicity and dysfunction inherent in the various forms of codified inequity that exist in society, such as that that is found in systemic racism and structural abuses of power, both of which the world was forced to confront and look at in a whole new way across all aspects of society thanks to the global anti-racism movement of 2020. As a very privileged white woman from the United States who currently sits in a position of power within my workplace, I feel that the very least I can do to contribute to this hopeful paradigm shift is to listen, learn, and then try and actually do the work. My talk today is simply a recounting of my experience. Um, I am practically applying a framework that I have learned through trainings and readings from experts in racism and anti-racism. And I share this with you today in the hopes that this pushes the dialogue forward and inspires potentially others to do this work so we can continue seeing, seeing what it looks like and seeing we can create a new world. A little bit about the Fine Arts Museums. Officially operating as the Corporation of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, FAMSF is an umbrella entity that operates the largest public arts institutions, uh, welcoming over 1.5 million visitors a year, and is comprised of two distinct museum buildings. The de Young Museum in Golden Gate Park, which holds uh, the objects and exhibits from American, Native American, African, Oceanic, Contemporary, and Textile and Costume Arts, and the Legion of Honor Museum in Lincoln Park, which holds and exhibits European and ancient art and collections from the Achenbach Center for Graphic Arts. All told, the museum steward approximately 160,000 works in its permanent collection and produces around 40 mostly loaned temporary exhibitions per year. So as you can imagine, we have a robust and hectic exhibition schedule that controls much of the pacing of activities involving collections and collections management. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a previous um, version of the of the of the presentation. Um, that's okay. I'll move forward. So, uh, to place this presentation in the context um, of the people involved in these discussions, <clears throat> um, it is. I'm very sorry. This is a very different. Um, I had sent a renewed one on Sunday, and I. It's a very different. Um, organization of the slide. Is this, is it not possible to shift it at this point? I imagine not. No. I'll continue. I'll, it's fine. I'll continue. So, so you place this presentation in the context of the people involved in these anti-racism discussions. It's important to understand the racial demographic of our staff. So FAMSF staff um, like all staff in almost all of the museums in the colonized world are overwhelmingly white, as you can see here. This is actually a graphic from our 2020 demographics. We um, do have updated graphics from 2021, where our staff is currently at 58.4%. So over the course of 2020 to 2021, we have increased our, um, uh, our diversity by 8% due to the intentionality of the um, of the hiring practices within the institution. But overall majority, um, uh, it, 
uh, excuse me, overall majority is what matters here because the frameworks about anti-racism are in relation to whiteness, specifically dominant structures and systems developed by white European colonists in America, at least. With that in mind, what becomes important to see is that the FAMSF staff members identifying as people of color make up um, about 42% as opposed to a 58% um, whiteness. So still a majority of a one single um, race of people. <clears throat> With regards to the demographic makeup of the folks directly involved in the implementation of our CMS, there are currently 96 CMS account holders among FAMSF's approximately 250 staff members. So roughly 38% of staff do or will directly interact with the collections CMS. Of those 96 account holders, about 20 are self-identified as people of color, and 11 of those participants are active in shaping the development of the system. So we are having these discussions with maybe one person of color usually no one in the room when it comes to developing our system. <clears throat> so in um, October 2019, when I began, we started a um, major uh, TMS implementation project. <clears throat> we have converted into Gallery Systems TMS Collections, which is their newest uh, browser-based version of their CMS. We have also um, converted into Conservation Studio to manage the conservation um, and reporting activities. We also, um, in this fall, will be unrolling the uh, Media Studio, which is Gallery Systems Dams program. And we have also um, purchased eMuseum in order to leverage their API for integration with our website. In January of 20, um, uh, sorry, in January of this year, actually, so four months ago, about five months ago, we have um, launched the TMS collections and the conservation studio programs to staff, um, trained them and onboarded them, and started implementation. Uh, Media Studio, we will be launching um, probably in the last quarter of this year, maybe first quarter of next year. And the eMuseum API, we sort of fast-tracked to uh, map into it due to an overlapping um, website redevelopment project that is launching in this summer. But <clears throat> the project, um, all told was immense for two reasons. First, um, has to do with just how complicated of a technical conversion it was. So prior to, prior to this conversion, prior to my coming on board, we had the, sorry, the Fine Arts Museums had no written documentation, no standards. They were using a database called 4D, which was developed in the early 90s, about 1992. And they had never migrated out of that database. The database <coughs> had ceased to be um, supported by the software developer and by in-house staff. There was no central management or oversight of data entry, of collections information, um, no administrator to the database. So this meant that over the years, in order to circumnavigate the behemoth that the 4D database had become, staff began creating individual FileMaker databases for every new exhibition and every new endeavor around the collections that they wanted to be able to track in a database system. So over the course of a pre-conversion scoping part of this project, we identified 89 distinct source databases that we wanted to convert into our TMS ecosystem. Uh, that included 4D, and it included about 80 uh, exhibition databases at that point, um, five conservation databases used independently by each conservation lab, each of the four conservation labs, um, two, uh, two non-accession collections, a prop collection, um, and a uh, mannequins collection, and then we found a bibliography database as well that we wanted to start um, as what, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, start to build out as well in TMS. So upon conversion, we have launched with about three, 300,000 object records, remembering only 160,000 of those actually represent op current objects in our collection, 80 exhibition records, 38,000 constituents, 1,600 incoming loans, and about 15,000 conservation reports. The effort to map and migrate these 89 databases into a single ecosystem took about two years to complete. And prior to that, the institution had been conducting a long phase of scoping to even make the decision about the CMS. 
So the Digital Transformation Project is, um, but I should, sorry, excuse me, let me back up. The reason we chose to use an anti-racist framework in order to implement the Digital Transformation Project um, comes from many overlapping reasons. First and foremost, uh, this project, about seven months into conversion, is, uh, in May of 2020, almost actually exactly to this week, um, the murder of George Floyd was filmed and went viral across the United States and the world, and uh, setting, setting off the anti-racist movement, a movement in the United States that has not been as big and wide sweeping since the 1960s civil rights movement. As that movement was happening and showing, uh, you know, forcing the United States to really reconcile once more with its uh, colonial history <clears throat> and the impacts um, of that being so ever present today still, the um, museums themselves were actually having their own comeuppance. Um, uh, starting in uh, around 2018, there actually had been a movement among museums to, um, at least in the United States, um, to really uh, call to task leadership in museums for work culture, for poor pay, for poor opportunity um, around um, uh, around 25 uh, museums themselves actually unionized their staff over the course of two years of 2020 and 2021. Um, I, there was, uh, I actually don't even know the count of it, but there was at least um, 10 or 15 distinct grassroots organizations, publishers, publishing books, protesting, um, hashtags that, that went viral across social media, um, museum staff uh, submitting confessionals around what their experience working in museums was like, people of color in museums speaking up, talking about how uh, inequitable their experience had been. All of this was happening at the same time that the staff, excuse me, that the fine arts museums was converting into TMS. So uh, it, as a result, fine arts museums themselves actually made a adjustment to their strategic plan that they had just released to place anti-racism at the top of um, their, their strategic plan for 2020 through 2025. <clears throat> their uh, leadership had introduced an, uh, becoming an anti-racist organization training to staff that we all undertook. And in that, we were introduced to several different frameworks that I was then allowed to sort of take and apply to this project. <clears throat> The other interesting thing about all of this as well um, that overlaps with this is uh, what is now called the Great Resignation, um, at least in the United States, where <clears throat> I unfortunately don't have the numbers on this, but it was a um, significant amount of, of employees across the United States that resigned over the course of the pandemic and refused to come back to work. Um, in in uh, MIT's Sloan School of Management released a study in January of this year that analyzed 34 million online employee profiles to identify US workers who left their employer for any reason between April and September of 2021, the prime months of, of this great resignation. And the study found that the culture, that toxic culture is the biggest factor pushing employees out during this time. And it's about 10.4 times more important than compensation in predicting turnover. And I think what's really important to note here is that of this, the number one factors that staff have reported as contributing to toxic work culture is a failure to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. <clears throat> one of the reasons the anti-racism movement personally resonates with me is that at its core, two of its goals are really just about happiness and peace. That's it. It's simply about creating an environment in which everyone is positioned and empowered to thrive and be fulfilled. That's not to say it's trying to create a utopia where no, there's no challenge. Actually, this process, um, as I'll get into, has actually been very challenging. Um, but it is holistically about everyone being allowed to, like I said, thrive and be fulfilled. When I... Uh, th this is the fourth C CMS conversion project I've done for different institutions. Every single project I have encountered as the arbiter of change for these institutions has 
created a pattern that has become too obvious to ignore. Usually when I'm in there, within the, I mean, within the first month that I'm there, when I'm starting to interview staff, understand the state of what the is that needs to happen, understand the state of how the uh, systems and the CMS currently work, I have, without, a, without fail, been uh, sort of the de facto point person for everyone's frustrations. So I would have staff coming up to me just giving me an angry soliloquy or just ranting about how things are. I've had tears. I've had just confessionals. This is this is consistently happened across across every institution. So, given this opportunity, given the time frame of when all this is happening, given what I am reading about the goals of anti-racism, it just felt like an opportunity that I I couldn't ignore. <clears throat> Ibram Kendi, in his now iconic bestseller, How to Be an Anti-Racist, states, the source of racist ideas is not ignorance and hate, but self-interest. He goes on to underscore the need for policy change over mental change as the way to eliminate racism and combat structuralized systems that promote and protect the self-interest of those in power. Holistically reviewing and changing the policies and procedures governing collections-related workflows as they intersect with our new TMS ecosystem was exactly how we have, we've approached this conversion and implementation. However, we've taken it one step farther than what Kendi offers because we do believe, especially at our institution, that mental change is almost as important as the, as the policy change itself. So the core framework I've been following over the course of FAMSF's implementation is a merging of two widely referenced sources. The first is Dr. Imbram Kendi's stepped model for how to implement anti-racist policies, published in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. The second is Tema, Dr. Tema Okun's white supremacy culture, which provides a list of 15 characteristics of white supremacy that show up in workplace cultures and organizations and provide and actually tend to damage those cultures because they're not chosen and they're not intentional. Combined, these two sources provided a framework that have guided how to address both the practical and mental aspects of the work, the policy and the language. We use the policy steps to guide how we develop new workflows and how we move through the process of implementation. And we use the list of characteristics as an openly shared language among staff to identify both workflows and interpersonal issues that need to be addressed. So what does that look like? So far, given how early into Im implementation we are, there are only three steps that we've really begun to earnestly tackle. So step one, acknowledging racism is a problem of policy, <clears throat> is something that the institution actually did together during our How to Be an Anti-Racist training. <clears throat> um, the outcomes of these trainings included the published staff demographics that I showed you earlier, um, and a staff-wide survey that was disseminated by leadership that identified the top three dominant characteristics across the organization. These results were disseminated to staff um, and, like I said, implemented into the um, 2020 strategic plan and was, um, uh, and was refined to um, place DEI efforts as the top most priority for both public offerings and workplace culture. Based on 108 completed surveys, the top three dominant cultural practices that were identified was power hoarding and defensiveness, a sense of urgency, and paternalism. Step two is where we have made the most progress thus far, uh, at least within the TMS conversion project. From July through August of 2020, I was part of a small three-person sub subcommittee on the IDEA Committee that conducted its own survey on the accessibility and transparency of collections information for staff, which we subsequently presented to the executive director in September of 2020. My colleagues on the subcommittee, excuse me, were from curatorial and archives respective respectively, and we were three white women doing this work. We received uh, 100 responses to the survey across eight divisions in the museum, which represents all of the divisions except for finance and accounting. The survey tackled these three core questions. Why is the permanent collection relevant to the job staff do for FAMSF? How does FAMSF staff go about obtaining information about the permanent collection? And what difficulties or challenges does staff face in obtaining information about the collection? Our final analysis involved translating our results to the shared language of anti-racism. This is a copy of the slide from the presentation we shared with the executive director showing, that the, res showing the results of that survey, specifically the last question around the challenges staff are facing. 
There was a sense of validation actually presenting these results to leadership because power hoarding, defensiveness, a sense of urgency, these were two of the these are these were two of the top three dominant cultures that we had already identified staff wide. So having identified these racist tenants that sort of existed broadly across the institution, the next step was for me to take that and apply it to the specific challenges facing the database implementation. So beginning in January 2021, about four months after we presented this to the director, I began forming working groups dedicated to facilitating inclusive discussions about the core workflows that we needed to integrate into the new database system. These working groups invited any and all staff who may touch a given workflow to sit at the table and have a voice in what was and was not working for them in their current processes and procedures. Over the course of our pre-conversion pre phase, we assembled around nine working groups to cover topics such as object movement, accessioning, exhibitions, outgoing loans, et cetera. To give you just a taste of that process, we began to, uh, to give you, excuse me, give you a taste of that process regarding our exhibition production work, working group in particular, we began to break down our loaned exhibitions workflow using a workflow breakdown spreadsheet, a very small excerpt you can see here. This document is probably 20 pages at least. We use this document to record notes about the specific tasks. Uh, if that task may interse intersect with data being entered or accessed via the database, what composed the steps of that task, who was involved, and how would that task ideally have happened? From January to June of 2021, so over the course of about six months, the core working team conducted interviews with 18 different teams across the organization who intersected in even the slightest way with loaned exhibitions. So that included our docents, our education, retail and visitor services team, in, in addition to, say, our exhibitions management, registrars, con conservators, designers. The outcome of those meetings was twofold. First, we were able to create a strategic plan for implementation that identified the priority of when we needed to tackle a specific workflow based on three initial priority phases for implementation, a launch phase, uh, first six months, and first 12 months. We were also able, <clears throat> sorry for the formatting on this, we were also able to document where the system had created workflows that reinforced traits of white supremacy. We went through this process with each working group all prior to actual conversion and launch of TMS. So over the course of that time, we documented the most problematic workflows and drafted ideal counteractions to hopefully begin to resolve the systemic issues we were seeing. So the four, the four workflows that we identified as the top priority most problematic were cataloging, accessioning, exhibition production, and conservation activities. In cataloging, we had no cataloging program. We had no standards. Curators were cataloging by themselves in their corner of 4D or keeping all their information in paper files in their offices. So the key way in which we were changing this process was to create standards, create written standards, create um, a cataloging tier, create cataloging program um, that we are actually just launching our first tier um, in the next two weeks. The accessioning workflow um, is one that was based on a pacing of committee meetings. So if a curator had an object that came up for potential acquisition, they would try to squeeze it into the next uh, acquisition committee meeting regardless of when that meeting was. So even if an object came up within a week before the meeting, they were putting that on the registrars to try to get that into place um, to make it for that meeting. So the new workflow that we are trying to uh, lift there is a pacing that's based on an internal review of objects. So uh, an object will come in now, it goes through a full review process that cure, uh, conservators get a chance to look at it, registrars get a chance to look at it, and then once it gets approved at, from the, at the director's level, then we would then schedule it into an upcoming acquisitions committee based on, based on time. We are hoping to actually present this new workflow to uh, our, our executive, excuse, excuse me, our executive director, in order to uh, make it for this summer's um, acquisition round. The exhibition production um, is run on a frantic schedule, um, and that frantic schedule has created a lot of workarounds, a lot of um, uh, doing things as quickly as possible. Therefore, doing things in silo, doing things with um, uh, on behalf of other people, uh, and so uh, this. These conversations, because exhibitions uh, 
workflows are actually so complicated and re such happen over the course of such a long period of time. These are very difficult conversations, um, and they are um, still very much ongoing. We don't have a lot of resolution in a lot of these just yet, but the aspects we have just identified we really want to try to shift are this um, uh, this sort of quantity over quality and this sort of um, individualism and paternalism that happens and make it more of a collaborative process and one where there is a lot of information transparency that folks can find the information they need without you know, waiting for another staff or a team to sort of gatekeep that, gatekeep that information for them. Something to note here regarding the urgency of time that we've identified in exhibition production um, is that, that being able to resolve that issue is a little out of our hands. And this is a, this is a really key point about trying to implement this sort of anti-racist work in a sort of central infrastructure, infrastructural way as opposed to say being the director coming from the top saying that we can do it differently is that we the working groups and the folks sort of working within exhibition production to make it happen have very little control over that schedule we have can raise our voice and we can say this isn't working but it's still going to get scheduled at this point so this is sort of a part of anti-racism work that is really important and really inherent which is that it's we're not going to create a fully anti-racist system because we're still working within these structures. And then conservation activities. So um, each lab was working um, by themselves. They individually would work with a curator. They'd have their own systems. Um, and so it was really siloed, very, very paper-based. And so now that we have this shared database that's inherently integrated with our with our collections database, you know, we're creating much more fully collaborative and even, even digital processes. And I think a really interesting part about this conservation process has been uh, conservators leaning in to create their own shared language as well, not specifically around anti-racism, but around how they identify annotations in uh, condition reports and things like that, right? So even at a very sort of simple level of, you know, paper lab would say this was a tear and, you know, textiles would call this an abrasion. There's elements where we're identifying where actually we can use the same language so we can use the same systems. So holistically, uh, throughout the course of this whole process, we've identified five core white supremacy characteristics that dominate all current collections-based workflows. And then we've documented to sort of have this as our, as our core strategy around how we would, what we would undertake to, to counteract them. So as a whole, we really identified quality over, oh, excuse me, quantity over quality, individualism, fear of open conflict, power hoarding, <clears throat> and paternalism. And so the, the core strategies that we are trying to implement in every conversation to counteract this is really around slowing the pace down, being more intentional, being collaborative to combat individualism. Everything is about collaboration. These using and implementing these weekly work, working groups as a place to actually confront and talk about what is not working. Creating living written documents and standards that are inherently made to be able to be to evolve over time, and really making the process about inclusion. If we're having a conversation that feels like someone uh, feels like we're talking on behalf of someone, we make sure to have a follow up meeting that we call, pull that person in and, and expand the conversation. The application of this work is that these terms are spoken openly and often to identify both issues to be changed and how we want to change them. Nearly every working group discussion, which continue to this day on weekly or biweekly bases, offer an opportunity to reinforce these new tenets of how we all want to work together. As suggestions and new workflows are created, we tend to repeat things like, let's remember to slow this down, let's be intentional, let's make it collaborative, let's include that person in this discussion, let's remember that we need to solve problems now, but we need to keep this open for how things are going to change in the future. This chart that you see here, and all the subsequent manuals and guidelines are ultimately being documented and disseminated in a TMS help wiki that we published in January alongside with our system, uh, with the ecosystem itself. <clears throat> and um, we will be using these documents to, um, as we get to the point of being able to call in, um, educating and disseminating and, and buy in on, from staff. So, 
we are sort of in this step three process of inventing new policies, um, but we haven't fully implemented them yet, right? So once we get to a point like I mentioned with cataloging just starting to unroll and accessioning starting to unroll soon, um, that is where we will then begin to start to uh, present this to leadership, present this to staff, and start to move forward in um, the additional steps of what it will take, disseminating and educating, um, making sure that we have people in place that are willing to continue this work moving forward. Um, once we sort of actually have buy-in and we start to have these systems um, tested, tried and tested, then we will need to devise ways to monitor our success and our efforts, uh, possibly identify some metrics we can capture, um, both um, qualitative and quantitative. We um, just hired, FAMSF just hired a diversity and inclusion manager, and I'm hoping to work with her on developing a system for how we can gather feedback, specifically from our colleagues of color, on where we, they may still be feeling exclusion, where these policies are still failing in their goals. Um, and as uh, Kendi's um, steps recommend, go back and review these workflows. If they're not solving these issues, revamp them, try it again. I really get the sense that we have only just scratched the surface of the discussions and changes that really need to be made. Um, every, the, the, this work has created this just umbrella of <laughs> project management and backlog list of things to tackle that um, I'm excited to see rise to the surface and also feel incredibly, incredibly, excuse me, incredibly overwhelming on a day-to-day -day basis. Ultimately, the goal is that when the time comes, myself and anyone else in positions of power across the breadth of collections-based activities continue to be replaced by future anti-racism sympathizers, allies, policymakers, so that the work we are doing now continues to be refined and shaped by anti-racism. Thank you so much. I do have some resources both on the um, used, what was used to create the framework and also the research of this presentation. But thank you for listening. So thank you, Adele, so much for this uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation, because um, yeah, this is sometimes, at least in Estonian context, uh, the issue of uh, racism or anti-racism. This is not something we have to think about every day. But mm. now it is interesting to see, hear how it is in other countries. So, but uh, we have also some little time for questions and comments. So uh, at the moment we have one question in workshop. And uh, here is one person who is asking, how much have you created systems on your own, like a cataloging program, or have you had some standards or management systems that you have taken over also from other museums, for example? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, is, uh, I'm not sure if the first part of the question is referring to my personal experience or uh, uh, implying into VMSF. <sighs> How much um, have you created systems on your own? Uh huh. I have. I have actually. Uh, I'll assume that's about my my experience. Uh, I have actually created other cataloging systems for other institutions. Um, I did a project. Uh, excuse me. The the previous institution I worked for was very much this. It, it was also a conversion into TMS, and then it was also a um, and it was for a new institution. Uh, uh, museum that has not been built yet, so it was taking the seed collection, inventorying it, and creating an initial catalog um, and um, uh, cataloging standards for that institution. So I've done that, that previously, so that work has come. And then I've been a part of other, especially earlier in my, my career, I've been a part of development of, of cataloging standards. Um, second part of that question was utilizing other, yeah, um, every, every discussion. Um, there are, uh, we, we refer to the breadth of knowledge of the museum industry at large everywhere we go. Where we're sort of heading with this, right, we, we're sort of in a place right now where we need to set up the foundation of the system, right? Since we have no standards, we've got data that I can't, I don't know how we're going to normalize. Um, the, the process right now is one of just fundamentally getting the system and getting data into places and into a state of clean that it provides us the basics of what we need to get the system in place, um, and then building in 
all of these new policies, building in all of the standards over time so that as we get there, this is all sort of building together. But really with this focus on the foundation of what we're doing is the foundation of long-term work, right? So a lot of this work is always about like, what do we need right now, but what is the goal? Because whatever we build right now, you know, it's not, it, it's as little of a workaround as we can do so that it is actually a foundation that continues in the future is what we're doing. And we use, um, uh, I mean, we have a whole folder in our in our shared drive just of other people's cataloging standards and other people's, you know, cataloging guidelines. We just sort of collect them and add them and we're always referring to them. Mm -hmm. I see. So thank you for this reply. And we don't have any questions in workshop at the moment, but maybe anybody from the audience has any question. Aha. Uh -huh. Very good. Hi. Uh can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you for this very interesting presentation. I'm from a museum in Germany, and while I feel that we don't have this issue of anti-racism, anti-racism simply because we mostly have white people working in the museums, I feel like a lot of point, things you've pointed out, like hoarding information and the power struggle, is, still holds true. Um, I have two questions actually. I wanted to know how is, if you present the results of your like findings, is there any resistance or is there a reflection going on? Like, oh, you're true, uh, you're right, we need to change that or no, that's not true, we are not racist, something like that. And the TMS is a, is a uh, organization, right? They offer uh, galleries, uh, they offer museum sy systems, right? Do you involve them and tell them about your results and like specifically with this anti-racist um, project so they can also use this for f uh, future references? Yeah, thanks. Great question. So the second part of that, um, they are aware that this work is going on. I actually presented a um, slightly pared down version of this at their recent conference in November. So, um, and I've been in um, close contact with their project managers. So they're actually aware that, that this is happening. Um, uh, no tangible partnership or follow through on that probably just yet. I think both of us, I think my, my sense is that Gallery Systems is um, overwhelmed themselves with just the new TMS collections program because it's so new and it's so beefy that they just have so much development going on. So, um, but they are aware. Um, first part of that, yes, a lot of resistance. Um, I have a lot of resistance and a lot of actually positive positivity. And that's been a really amazing aspect of all of this is that in terms of resistance, it I have, I have had the personal experience of, say, uh, in a one-to-one -one meeting with someone mentioning, "Listen, this is a this is a product of an urgency of time that's that is really unfairly uh, being reflected on what you're asking me to tell my staff to do, and I don't want to do that." And had someone laugh at me, right? So I've had that experience um, in working groups. Uh, it's a really fascinating psychological study and people listening to what um, they do or do not want to hear. Uh, we have, uh, I've had folks um, tantrum in meetings and walk up and leave. I've had um, folks just sort of, you know, the conversations are always sort of about pushing back and always like, well, this is the way we do it. A lot of it, a lot of it is, well, this is the way that we've done it. This is the way that we've done it. And so it's a constant conversation of yes, but, right? And, and really, you know, my job these days, I feel like is just like advocacy, like advocacy. And the sort of overlying element to this as well is the fact that, um, you know, this is the first time a collections information program has ever existed for this institution. So not only are we telling folks that they need to treat each other differently in workflows, but we're trying to get them to understand what it means to actually have a functional working database and ecosystem to help support all of their activities. There's just so many layers of change for folks. And so um, it gets really complicated. So like my, my job inherently is, is really a people job. It's 100%, I am like a cross, cross-institutional liaison f advocating for change, right? It's literally what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but interestingly, you know, you, you mentioned that your institution is largely white. The, uh, 
Tema Okun in those white um, in the white supremacy characteristics mentions in 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 their document that these are characteristics that don't that exist regardless of race because we live in a white supremacy world, right? We live in a world dominated and created by white people. And so whether or not you even have an institution that's primarily people of color, these characteristics still show up because it's the system that we're used to and what we live in. So, you know, like I said, we are actually in, an, you know, even my institution's primarily white. A lot of these working groups are primarily white. We are. See, I mean, the moment, we, moment these were introduced to me, it was so blatantly clear that these were the issues that we were actually struggling with as an institution as well, and we're mostly white as well, you know? So it's, it's, it's um, a really, I think, key point to understand is that you don't have to be a person of color to be experiencing this also, because we still live in a white dominant world. Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting point. No, I mean, interesting is a very bad word to reflect my feelings at it's this point. Yeah. But uh, yes, if we think about this kind of progressive world order, um, capitalism, neoliberalism uh, developed by Western people, then I know I think I understand yes, you. Good. Because I was also thinking during, during your presentation that, well, but some of these issues are probably signs of bad man managers, decisions <laughs> or something like this. But yeah. when you explain it, if you put it that way, then yes, it starts to make more and more sense. Wonderful. So, but uh, I guess we don't have much time to discuss this topic. This is a topic that I hope we can, that you can pursue even uh, further. So let's give an applause to Adele uh, for her presentation and also for these responses. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.